Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. We begin our study of Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, last week, and we were able to read and consider Luke's treatment of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. It was a milestone moment in New Testament uh, history, certainly, the history not just of the church, but really of God's saving ways with mankind as a whole. For Saul uh, would become the great apostle Paul who left a monumental footprint on human history. His story gives us a vivid example of what we might call an unexpected conversion, which as, I, as the words roll off my tongue, I think every conversion uh, is really unexpected in a sense. Uh, because he illustrates the possibility of God turning a person going hellbound in one direction, 180 degrees to go in the other way. And so here in him we see the wolf that had been preying on God's flock, not only joined the flock, but became their loyal and fervent uh, shepherd. He's been a fervent shepherd to you, to me. We're here today uh, for many reasons, thanks to, to him. But as we will see today, first, uh, Saul of Tarsus did decidedly join the church he had once persecuted. Uh, Luke has described his condition on the Damascus Road after the risen Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him. We looked at that last week. He was led by the hand, uh, blind, into Damascus. And as verse 9 went on to explain, he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So let's read the passage, or at least a few verses of the passage, beginning in, in verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So the Lord had been active, a vision to one man in the city of Damascus, now a vision to another man. Verse, 12, verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. So we'll, we'll read a, a few more verses here in a minute, but that's uh, good for now. Saul had been a re religious uh, zealot. Uh, convinced that he was doing the work of God when in reality he was God's enemy. In persecuting the followers of Jesus Christ, he was in reality uh, persecuting Jesus himself. Uh, that's what we read last week. But Saul was suddenly and unexpectedly arrested by God, struck blind by the light of Christ, and then Numb from that experience, he neither ate nor drank uh, for three days. And now in these verses that follow, he emerges as this walking and active miracle of God. Saul is now in the church, uh, a functioning member of the body of believers that he had once looked down upon with such disdain. 
And that really is a kind of sub-theme of these verses that we're considering today. Luke provides us the experience of Saul as a young believer in the church of God. And we're immediately introduced to Ananias. Ananias, uh, Barclay called a forgotten hero of uh, the church. Uh, what, may have, what must have sounded to Ananias at first like a death sentence. Uh, go inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Uh, provokes this immediate objection. He apparently couldn't help himself, even in the midst of a vision from God, from protesting. Uh, Wait a minute, Uh, I know this guy, uh, Saul. Uh, I've heard, I know what he's doing. I know what he's doing in uh, Damascus. Uh, Word had spread amongst the believers there that Saul was on his way. You can imagine the anxiety I mean, think about it. They knew what he was doing. They knew he had come to town. You can imagine the anxiety that had come over the believers there. You read the commentaries on Acts and find that many of them uh, take a moment here to sort of scold uh, Ananias. Uh, I tend to think we should uh, cut him a little bit of of slack. Uh, Yes, he showed a deficit of faith. You'll hear in Dan's message this morning a lot about deficits of faith. So yes, he showed a deficit of faith, but we all tend to flinch or at least hesitate at task uh, far less dire than the one he was given. Most of the great servants of God in the Bible uh, did flinch uh, when first given uh, their orders. Uh, Gideon, well, sure, but uh, first uh, let me put a fleece out here on the ground, and then now let me put another fleece on the ground. Uh, Abraham was the great exception to this rule. Uh, Abraham, uh, go sacrifice your son, your only son, and Abraham got up early the next morning, loaded up his donkey to go sacrifice his son. But Moses, you know, Moses wasn't going to run out of objections for not going uh, to Pharaoh until God uh, would provide him some kind of crutch some kind of help to lean on. And I think Moses and and Gideon and and Ananias help us to understand that God uses real people, uh, real people like you, like uh, me, to work out his purposes and to unfold his perfect will. Ananias was a normal man and a faithful man, Acts 22. Remember, there's three accounts of the conversion of Saul in the book of Acts here, Acts 22, before the Jewish leaders, Acts 26, before uh, Agrippa the king. In Acts 22, uh, Ananias is further described as a devout man with a good reputation among the Jews in Damascus. And so here the Lord bears with him a little bit and gives him a little context in verse 15. Uh, He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So go, Ananias, you are my messenger, for I will show Saul how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, This man, Saul, who had uh, heretofore done nothing but war against the Lord Jesus and rage against his followers was in reality a chosen vessel of Jesus, an instrument in his service, an important tool in the divine toolkit. And God would use him in a great way to bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ before the world. And of course, that is what the Apostle Paul did, we know, in an amazing whirlwind of relentless and bold missionary activity that eventually took him all over the civilized world. Uh, This man, who up to this point had made it his life's devotion to wreak suffering on anyone who would name the name of Jesus, would come to endure himself one tribulation after another, seemingly increasing in intensity. Uh, The longer he served, the more faithfully he obeyed. And you know, he chronicles those in his epistles, the the beatings, the imprisonments, the shipwrecks. But these sufferings came upon him uh, from the very beginning. And we really learned this in in these verses. 
uh, one of the first things that the Lord did was introduce Saul to his new family. He had an old family. Uh, he had an old circle uh, that he ran with. <clears throat> the Lord yanked him out of that circle and put him into a new uh, circle. And so here's this new family, first Ananias and the believers in Jerusalem and later the disciples in uh, the believers in Damascus, and then later the disciples in Jerusalem. And they were not at all eager initially to embrace this man. But the Lord's words uh, to Ananias were convincing after the initial uh, shock of the vision. What he spoke to him at the start may have begun to penetrate his thinking. In verse 11, Saul is praying. Now, I don't like this translation that much. It leaves out a little word that's in the original text. It's the word behold. Behold, look, Saul is praying. And the Lord was hearing his prayers. So perhaps Ananias was encouraged by that to reconsider. It's not that Saul of Tarsus had never prayed before. You know, the Pharisees were prayers. They prayed uh, they had their rote uh, prayers. Uh, Jesus described those self-righteous prayers, the formulaic and hypocritical uh, nature of them. But this was different. That there was nothing hollow about this prayer. For the first time in his life, Saul was truly a prey, and God was listening. I imagine his prayers uh, during these first three days were similar to the prayers that you and I prayed when we were first converted, when God in grace first drew us to himself and revealed himself to us. <clears throat> we may have heard it, but we weren't listening. We hadn't comprehended it. But he drew us to himself, and he revealed himself in all his uh, holiness, and he showed us our need for forgiveness. He revealed our sin to us, and then he gave us uh, the assurance that he had saved us, he had forgiven us in Christ, in his son. And, and so these were prayers, these early prayers that we prayed were prayers of confession and prayers of gratitude, projecting a deep longing for a communion with God now after a lifetime of ignorance, a lifetime of alienation. Remember, Jesus had told Simon the Pharisee in Luke 7, after Simon had complained about Jesus allowing the sinful woman to bathe his feet in the, with the vial of perfume and in her, her tears, Jesus had told Simon that the woman loved much because she had been forgiven much. And so Saul now was uh, praying like he had never prayed before, and he knew that he had been forgiven much. And therefore, his prayers now must have been like the tears and perfume of the sinful woman, uh, meant to anoint the feet of the one that he had once scorned. He loved much, and his prayers were bathed in love for Christ. Saul, behold, he's praying. So Luke tells us in verse 17 that uh, Ananias, here's the obedience, Ananias departed, and he entered the house where Saul was, and he laid his hands upon him. Perhaps that was to identify with him, or maybe it was just to, uh, an expression of tenderness uh, to him. After all, he'd been uh, quite stunned from his experience. It had been three days without food, without uh, drink. But then he addressed him, Brother Saul. And... I can't imagine how that sounded uh, to Saul's ears. Uh, they were likely, likely the first words that he heard from any Christian, Brother Saul. How could it be? He must have thought, how could a man, this Ananias, who had once been in his crosshairs uh, with full knowledge of that, now welcome him as a brother? Only grace could make that possible. The, commonality of experience that one who has been shown mercy can exhibit to another. We love because he first loved us and we are merciful because we were shown mercy. Edmund Spencer put it in verse, who will not mercy unto others show, how can he mercy ever hope to know? 
So Ananias extended mercy to Saul and fulfilled his mission. And immediately our physician writer here, Luke, explains that something like scales uh, fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then Luke writes, he got up and was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. Now, I'm, I'm anxious to make a point uh, this morning. Sometimes we take some liberties, but I think this is a legitimate point. What we have here in the conversion experience of this very famous Christian man, really a hero, what we have is the normal Christian life. Uh, first, God draws him to himself and saves him. Uh, the Spirit of God indwells him. And then in unison with this spirit, this communion of prayer begins. He's filled with the spirit, which means that the spirit now is controlling him. And then in obedience, uh, he's baptized. And I would just remark that here's yet another example that baptism is not essential to salvation. It's essential that we obey and be baptized, but it's not essential to salvation. It's not a requirement. Saul's already been saved. He's already been praying. He's already been called brother uh, by Ananias. And here the natural consequence is the, the obedience of baptism. So he's baptized, and then as we see, as we go into the next section, he begins to fellowship with the body of Christ, and he begins to give witness and testimony to his faith. That's the normal Christian life. That's the life that you and I uh, ought to be engaged in. You know, Paul over and over uh, would say in his letters, and people think it arrogant, but he would say, be imitators of me. He had the authority to say that, uh, but uh, we are to imitate him. We are to imitate him in the normal Christian life. But let's read now, beginning uh, with the latter part of 19. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, and you might note there the correlation between many days in verse 23 and the several days up in verse 19, those are a reference to the same time period, several days, now when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But the disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. So here is uh, God's chosen instrument out of the gate, uh, so to speak. He hits the ground running first by enjoying this newfound relationship, this newfound fellowship he discovered with others who had had the same experience that he had had. Luke writes that he was with the disciples who were in uh, Damascus. He, he would have given no thought at that moment of forsaking the assembling together of the saints, as the author of Hebrews would later warn. He wanted to be with them. He was with them. And so what a time of, at first, really awkward sharing, I would think, having him there. Uh, the sharing of experiences, the sharing of reconciliation, of the newly discovered meaning of passages in the scripture. This was the early church. Uh, there was a lot of studying going on. There was a lot of revelation occurring as far as reading scriptures they had read before and finding uh, new meaning, true meaning uh, in them. And so this shared surprise that Saul was now on the, the same side, so to speak, as the Damascus believers surely uh, was part of their fellowship. And, and 
um, would think that Saul had recounted for them his own experience on the road to Damascus. Surely he confessed how wrong he had been. He asked forgiveness, uh, how full of sorrow he was over his, his actions. He had been an enemy of these people. He was a threat to their very lives. He was a disaster in waiting. And so I'm sure all that was going on, but in the same breath, he would have shared his joy and wonder over how the very Savior that he had uh, persecuted irresistibly yanked him out of his sinful course and dramatically placed him on another course. The other disciples there, they had their own experiences to share, which, though perhaps not as dramatic, were equally surprising. Uh, this was the fellowship of the forgiven in Christ. And Saul must have certainly also experienced, think about this, with these disciples in Damascus, his first observances of the Lord's Supper. This would have taken place uh, in, the, in these days, in these several uh, days. Do you remember your first observance of the Lord's Supper as a, as a true believer? I don't. I don't remember, but I bet the Apostle Paul would remember for the rest of his life that first observance of the Lord's command to remember him, this solemn partaking of the bread and the wine which gave Saul a weekly opportunity to ponder afresh what Jesus had done for him. So he was out of the gate in the sense of being in the church and following in the practices of the church, but also in the sense of obedience to the Lord's great commission. If there was ever anyone who was obedient to the Lord's great commission, it was the soon-to-be apostle Paul. But I would conjecture for Paul, uh, for Saul, that, had, that might have been undertaken without even knowing it of that commission that the Lord had spoken before he ascended. Saul uh, very well may have just been a, unable not to speak out in witness to his new discovery. And he wasn't bashful about his uh, newfound faith. Luke says that immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the Son of God. Now that's rich in irony, for you remember that it was to the synagogues in Damascus that Saul was headed when he had first <laughs> departed Jerusalem. We learned that in the second verse of chapter 9, how he had gone to the high priests and obtained these letters of extradition from him uh, to take to the synagogues in Damascus. Uh, how surprising, how ironic that now he found himself, the one who was to persecute and to kill those who were in the way, uh, now he's in the way himself. He's in the synagogues for a very different purpose. Now he's firmly in the way. And rather than attempting to bind the disciples of Jesus, he's attempting to bring more into the way. But here in verses 20 and 22, we, we read of the content of how he was doing that. And generally speaking, and I indicate it in the outline, what Saul the disciple was proclaiming was Jesus as the Christ. But his witness at this early stage was fundamentally uh, two-pronged. Uh, One related to the other. First, Saul was arguing that Jesus was the Son of God. He had come to understand that on that road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him in a blaze of light. And that knowledge that Jesus was the Son of God was the basis of everything he was now learning and discovering about him because if Jesus is truly the Son of God, then he is God himself. And if he is God, then he has all the attributes of God. Uh, he is holy. He's perfect. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's truth. And consequently, if he's truth, then everything that he has said is true. And his interpretations of the scriptures are the correct interpretations. And because Jesus is God, then his death was an atoning death. And it was sufficient to serve as a substitute for a multitude of sinners like himself, like Saul, 
Secondly, what follows from the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God is that he is the Messiah whom God, uh, through the prophets, had promised. It struck me, going through this again, you know, I look around, I just, so many of you have read this passage so many times, but it struck me this time. Uh, how did Saul uh, make such an advance in his knowledge? So how, how did he do it so quickly uh, from just days before until this report in verses 20 and 22? How did he do this flip-flop uh, so quickly? Well, Saul had an extensive knowledge already of the, of the scriptures, of the Old Testament scriptures, but scriptures by virtue of his Pharisaic studies. He was a, he was a graduate of the theological seminary, so he, 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 he had a lot of knowledge already. And you can just picture him in these first few days uh, pulling out, you know, going to his bookshelf, figuratively, uh, pulling out the scrolls and reading those passages that he was familiar with from his life of study and uh, the, these, these messianic passages and how it must have all come together for him. Uh, verse 22 states that Saul uh, was proving uh, that Jesus was the Christ. He was proving it. Uh, now, certainly one part of the answer to my question, you know, how, how did this happen so quickly, uh, was the filling of the Spirit. That's one part of it. Much as with Stephen uh, before him, uh, whom Saul had seen uh, with his own eyes, bearing the same kind of witness that Saul now is, uh, Luke expressed in, in verse 10 of chapter 6 that those who argued with Stephen, quote, were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so now uh, Saul spoke with that same convincing spirit. But also, he was avidly discovering the remarkable concurrence between what the scriptures said and what had actually occurred in the life and ministry of Jesus. That word proving, look at it in verse 22, it means literally something like uh, pie piecing together or putting together with a view to reaching an accurate conclusion. So you can picture I uh, saw <clears throat> with these scrolls laid out, uh, studying these scriptures and laying them al alongside, so to speak, uh, the record of what Jesus had said and what Jesus had done. Like putting together a, a, a puzzle. He's got the scriptures. He's got the reports on Jesus. He's got the sayings of Jesus that he's been given. Uh, the cross, which had been such a stumbling block to him and to all the Jewish leaders, he now was seeing as the fulfillment of these scriptures, such, such as Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, the suffering servant song of Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, like a lamb that was led to slaughter. He saw it with new eyes, <clears throat> with, with new understanding. He now looked at the reports of Jesus having been resurrected uh, from the dead alongside a scripture like Psalm 16, where the psalmist expressed that God would, quote, not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. I would think that Saul just could not contain himself uh, doing this. It was so exciting. Uh, what had happened to him recently was exciting for sure, uh, and he would go on to tell others about his experience, but far overshadowing that were these majestic truths about Jesus, uh, the reality of what the truth actually was now made clear to him, and he immediately began to give testimony to it. Testimonies are good, and I say that because sometimes we disparage uh, personal testimonies. We do that. Uh, typically because they're often extremely uh, self-centered, self-congratulatory. Uh, some of you have given your testimony. I've, I've given my testimony. It's, it's a perilous uh, course. But it's never too early to give testimony to what God has done in a person's life as long as it is centered and focused on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our own experience may illustrate 
these truths, may add color to it, may make a personal connection uh, with it, uh, but it ought, our experience ought not to dominate uh, what we say. And you can tell by Luke's description that all that was true in Saul's witness during these days. Those who heard him, as he says in verse 21, were continually amazed. What were they amazed at? Well, they were amazed that the man they had all heard about who loathed the name of Jesus and sought to kill anyone associated with Jesus now was filled with admiration and a new devotion to the very same now Savior. He couldn't stop talking about Jesus, the one that he had so disdained before. So that was his testimony. But the next verses, uh, beginning with verse 23 and really on through verse 31, give us a chronology of sorts of what uh, happened with Saul and then with the church after those first few days in Damascus. And it will require some explaining because Luke characterizes a period of time there in verse 23, before the time the unbelieving Jews hatched a plot to do away with Saul, he characterizes it as being many days. Later on in the epistle to the Galatians, uh, Paul gives more detail about these days. In Galatians 1.17, in that biographical portion of his letter to the church in Galatia, he describes a visit he made to Arabia. After he first arrived in Damascus, but before he returned back again to Damascus and was forced to flee the city and then make his way to Jerusalem. Also, in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, that passage where Paul lists the things, all the things that he had suffered from in, in his ministry, he mentions this incident in Damascus when he was rescued from the Jews' death plot by being stealthily let down from the city wall in a basket. He, he mentions that in 2 Corinthians 11 as an example of his weakness and really of his fear. It was when all his struggles really began. It was when he really started suffering for the name of Christ. Now, New Testament scholars speculate about why he went to Arabia when he was in Damascus. Uh, what they knew as Arabia was not that far away. And in that day, Arabia, quote, Arabia was ruled by the Nabataeans, whose king was Aretas. And Paul mentions that in 2 Corinthians in order to add this bit of information to the story, that it was <clears throat> the ethnarch, a, a, a governing official, it was the ethnarch under Aretas, the king, who had joined with the Jews in Damascus in guarding the city in order to capture Saul. Now, Luke doesn't mention that here, see? And so while some speculate that Saul went to Arabia for a time of contemplation and meditation, a, a sort of spiritual retreat, which may have been partly true, it's more likely that he had traveled to Arabia in order to widen his testimony for Christ. And likely his witness there was not appreciated. Uh, and the ethnarch of Aretas the king had pursued Saul back to Damascus and then coordinated with the hostile Jews there in order to take him into custody. And all that being said, his excursion to Arabia most likely took place during these many days that Luke cites. And it likely also accounts for the three years later comment of Galatians 1.18 after which Saul went to Jerusalem. But more importantly, it led, did anyone really care to hear any of that? <laughs> I have these questions and I must answer them. So more importantly, it led to the first serious fulfillment of Jesus' words to him, that he would show him how much he must suffer for his name's sake. It would be the First of many times that the future apostle would barely escape with his life. Well, upon his deliverance, Saul did make his way to Jerusalem. We pick it up again at verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him. 
and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews. Now here we're, we're reminded again of Stephen. This, is, this was the same track that Stephen was on. Stephen, who Paul watched him die. He was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. And then let's go ahead and read verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. So when Paul came to Jerusalem, or rather returned to Jerusalem, he found himself in a much different place than when he had departed there three years previous. He found in Jerusalem uh, further suffering. Uh, gone were the friendships, all the associations which he had once had. These people, his former comrades, knew about his uh, defection from Judaism. They wanted nothing to do with him. Eventually, they tried to kill him, verse 29. And the believers there in Jerusalem, uh, the, the Christ followers, uh, didn't have that firsthand experience uh, with them that the saints in Damascus had had. Uh, they only remembered the heartbreak that he had caused for him, caused for them, and, and, and they were still afraid of him. They actually thought his conversion was a sham. Now, surely that was difficult for Saul uh, to be rejected by some. We can understand uh, the way he was received, but that doesn't justify it. On occasion, the elders of Believer's Chapel were alerted uh, to uh, the fact that a certain individual in another town, perhaps, with a sordid past has has plans to come here, they want to join our fellowship, and, and it gives the elders a uh, pause. And there by necessity, there, a little background check uh, might be in order. And perhaps the church in Jerusalem could have done a little more due diligence. Uh, send somebody five days to, up to Damascus to check out the story. Maybe they did. But in the end, Barnabas, fortunately, true to his name, son of encouragement, uh, came to Saul's defense. Luke says he brought them to the apostles. We know from Galatians, it was really Peter and then James, the, the, the brother of Jesus. But it was enough. Barnabas's word was good enough uh, for those in Jerusalem now. And so Saul was free, according to verse 28, to move about Jerusalem, engaged in the thing that would be his life's occupation, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And so in this imperfect church, the home of the apostles, this church, what did they call the church? The Jerusalem church. There the apostles were, but it was an imperfect church, and there was both opposition to Saul and then finally acceptance, allowing Saul to continue living the normal Christian life and to continue making his way upon the way. He wasn't in Jerusalem for long. In Acts 22, Paul uh, relates how the Lord appeared to him while he was in a trance and told him to flee Jerusalem, so he did. And the saints there uh, helped him by bringing him down to Caesarea first and then on uh, to Tarsus, his hometown, where for a number of years, uh, Saul lived quietly. In Galatians 1.22, he states there that he was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea. The people only heard rumors that he, quote, who once perse persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. These were the unknown years of Saul during which he kept his head down. I suspect, and enjoyed uh, the preparation uh, necessary for the important ministry that he was to have. He had left Jerusalem in the first place to persecute Christians, and our story closes today with him fleeing Jerusalem 
once more, this time himself a persecuted Christian. And then Luke closes the account in verse 31 with one of these periodical progress reports that he gives on the early church. They enjoyed peace. They enjoyed peace. What a great blessing uh, brought about by the Lord in large part by removing a certain uh, tormentor uh, from them and he continu and they continued on in the normal Christian life, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church continued to increase. Luke's focus is going to shift now back to Peter, and we won't hear about uh, Saul again, or Paul, as he'll soon be known, until a brief mention in chapter 11, verse 25, when Barnabas leaves to look for Saul of Tarsus in order to bring him uh, to Antioch to help in the ministry there, his old a friend whom he remembered, though hardly any others did. But of course, we know who he is, uh, the most influential man in the New Testament period, the most influential man I made the claim last week in the history of the world. But for seven, eight, nine, maybe ten years, well, God was working in his life in some way, preparing him for a lifetime of ministry. That's what we need to learn. There's a lesson here for us in imitating him, uh, to wait on the Lord patiently in our own lives, in the lives of those for whom we, we pray. In the meantime, we live the normal Christian life. Uh, we have fellowship, we pray, we witness, uh, and we await God's leading in our lives. Sometimes it's exciting, Sometimes it's tedious, uh, but always we keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus, just as Saul of Tarsus and the Apostle Paul did. That may, may that be our prayer. May our church be filled with people living the normal Christian life, bearing testimony inside, outside the walls of the church. Let's pray that way. Father, thank you for... Uh, sending uh, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, thank you, first of all, for appearing to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, for arresting him there, for revealing yourself to him, and for making him uh, an instrument in the ministry of the gospel. Lord, may we uh, follow in his steps, may we imitate him as he so often expressed Imitate him in the sense that uh, we too uh, love Christ. We too, in, with grateful hearts, like to proclaim his name, let others know about it. Uh, we too, who don't uh, let suffering uh, deter us from uh, living a life of following after Christ. We do suffer, Father. And in the mystery of your providence, we understand that to be a good thing.